Hello, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Um, we have, in the, over the last few weeks, we've put out videos uh, about the Bible. Um, we, uh, the first video was uh, why these 66 books. The second video was the Bible as, the, as God's Word. And the third video was answering two accusations against the Bible or two criticisms of the Bible. And uh, this is our fourth video, and possibly our last one. Uh, this one's called Alleged Errors in the Bible. In the last few videos, we've been talking about the Bible as God's Word. Um, we've talked about canonicity. We've talked about inspiration. We've talked about inerrancy. Um, and last week, we discussed uh, some alleged discrepancies in the Bible. In this session, I want to talk just a little bit more about the nature of the Bible and then we'll deal also with some alleged errors. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures. Um, they are life to us, they are bread to us, they are food to us. Um, they give light to the eyes, um, they rejoice our hearts. Uh, they point us in the way that we should go. Um, they reveal uh, you uh, to us. They, they reveal so much about ourselves to us as well and our need for salvation. So we thank you for your word. Father, we ask that you would guide now, that your Holy Spirit would guide us in our understanding of the nature of Scripture. And I ask, Lord, that you would increase our trust and confidence in Scripture in this uh, process. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the nature of the Bible. Uh, the various books of the Bible were written in specific languages, in specific cultures, with specific understandings and specific manners of speaking, and with a specific limit to their understanding of the world. And then those books that were written in that particular time, uh, in those time, particular time frames, uh, those books had to be translated and interpreted to all other cultures and eras. And translation and interpretation are not perfect. So the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic in the ancient Near East. And the New Testament was written in Koine Greek uh, about 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire. Some parts in the land of Palestine, the land of the Jews, and some parts in, um, in uh, Greek territory. So the New Testament was also, to complicate things further, the New Testament was written in Greek but the spoken language of Judea and Galilee and Samaria, Palestine, at the time of Jesus was Aramaic. So even when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are writing their Gospels in Greek, they are already translating. They are translating Jesus' teachings, for Jesus himself spoke and taught in Aramaic. Um, God chose to use men captured in time, specific points in time, through whom to reveal himself and truth to people of all times and all eras. The perfect God accommodated himself to human civilization, which is often imperfect. So where am I going with this? Well, a few different ways. Um, first of all, books written in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek in civilizations thousands of years ago have been translated for us into English in the 21st century. Have you ever heard the phrase, lost in translation? Um, full understanding of the cultural milieu in which these books were originally written is sometimes difficult. Even understanding a different culture in our own day is difficult. Um, so if you went to, if you left, if you grew up in the United States and you left and went to an Asian culture or an African culture, there, uh, there's some prep work to be done or you're gonna be a little bit lost or even after you have done some prep, prep work, you go into another culture and you might make some cultural mistakes, things that aren't readily available, re readily understandable by you because you grew up in a different culture. So imagine um, the difference between cultures that are separated by centuries. Also, when we don't understand something in the Bible, we can't call up the original writers of scripture. We can't call up their contemporaries or their peers either because they're all, they're all gone. They're all dead and they've been dead for a long time. Now this isn't, to, this isn't to say that we can't understand the Bible. We certainly can understand the scriptures, but it takes work. And um, there, will sometimes, um, there will sometimes be some head scratching on our part 
as to try and understand the cultural, the, the culture, or the way that, that Scripture words things. Um, also, this difference in time and culture between when the Bible was written and when we're getting to read it must be taken into account when trying to understand some of the Bible's alleged discrepancies. And, and even apart from discrepancies, things that seem clear. For instance, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, John says that he saw seven golden lampstands. Um, now, what do you picture in your mind when he says that? What do you picture that he saw? And I wonder if what you're picturing in your mind is the same thing that I'm picturing in my mind. And interestingly, the King James Version translates that same Greek word as candlesticks. Now, I have a different image for a candlestick than I do for a lampstand. And then I wonder what John himself saw. If he actually saw lampstands, or if he saw candlesticks, or did he see some kind of a form of light that he had never seen before, and he just used the image that was the word that, that in his own language, that uh, most approximated, that came closest to what it is that he saw. I mean, for instance, did he see modern day lamps with light bulbs? I doubt it. But if he did, what would he call it? He didn't have the phrase light bulb. Um, so he would perhaps use lampstand or candlestick. Uh, is he wrong for using approximate language for something that he doesn't understand? No. And it could be he saw actual lampstands. It could be he saw something that uh, he had no way of defining, um, but he had to con he had to use what language was available to him. So you know that's just a that's just an example of some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, complications that come in terms of translation and interpretation. Sometimes, when translating from another language, um, there are words that simply have no exact counterpart in the language in which it's uh, being translated. Uh, my my wife speaks Spanish, um, and, and, so, and she talks about, she, sometimes she'll say, oh, there's this uh, phrase or word that we used in Spanish, and, and she can't bring it over into English because there's not an exact phrase or word that compares. Um, so, you know, if there are some, if there's some such difficulties between Aramaic, the spoken language of the New Testament, and Greek, the written language of the New Testament, then Mark may choose one Greek word for an Aramaic word that Jesus used, and Luke may choose another Greek word for an Aramaic word, for the same Aramaic word. Uh, they may choose different Greek words for the same Aramaic word that Jesus used because there's not an exact equivalent in Greek. Um, so, you know, they, they choose approximations as to what, uh, what it was that, what specific word Jesus might have used. Now, something else to know about the Bible is that the authors of Scripture are not bound to write things in chronological order. They're not bound to write things in chronological order. So, um, and so you will see, for instance, that Matthew may record certain events in the life of Jesus in a different order than maybe Mark does. Um, so who's wrong? Well, neither's wrong. Neither purports to write a chronological, um, a chronological account of Jesus' life. Just because they don't announce that they're taking things out of order doesn't mean that they are thus in error. So for instance, Matthew and Luke both record um, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness by the devil. And there are three temptations. Matthew has one order, and uh, Luke has a different order. Matthew's order, you could say, would be one, two, and three, and Luke puts them in order of one, three, and two. Um, is either one wrong? Neither one is wrong. Uh, neither one purports to say that um, theirs is the correct order. Um, they, at least they both don't purport to say that. So sometimes writers will take material and they will put it together, not chronologically, but they will put it together because uh, this material all addresses one particular theme or topic. Chronologically speaking, the book of Jeremiah is all out of order, but Jeremiah doesn't assert that his book is written in chronological order. And by the way, modern writers are doing this more and more, um, both nonfiction and fiction writers. Uh, don't necessarily write in a strictly chronological order. Movies and TV uh, TV shows have flashback scenes, and they and they're using those more and more frequently. They jump all around in terms of the timeline. So that's something to keep in mind as well. 
and sometimes details differ from one account to another because of differing perspectives. So um, you have uh, differing perspectives on the same event, and, and they'll seem like contradictions. They'll seem like contradictions. <laughs> the, the differing perspectives will seem like contradictions, but they aren't. I shared with you in, in last week's video uh, two uh, uh, criticisms of the Bible, answering two criticisms of the Bible. I shared with you last week about the woman who was struck by a bus um, and killed while she was standing on a street corner. And then uh, there was another account of the same death uh, that that woman was killed when the car that she was riding in um, was in an accident and she was thrown from the car and killed. So which report is correct? Was she struck by a bus and killed while waiting for a bus? Or was she in an accident thrown from a car and killed? Well, it turns out that both reports were accurate. Um, they sound like they were contradictory, but they were both ac accurate. Um, she was struck by a bus while waiting for a bus, and a compassionate motorist picked her up, um, put her in his car, and was driving her to the hospital when he was in an accident and she was thrown from the car and killed. They different perspectives. They seem to be contradictory, but they weren't. They were both true. So you're, you're sitting at the dinner table, and little Johnny speaks up and says, we learned in school today that the Declaration of Independence was the cause of America. And little Jimmy says, well, my teacher says America came about because of the U.S. Constitution. And little Jessica says, no, my teacher says that it was because George Washington won the Revolutionary War. And little Francis says, no, my teacher says it was because we was fed up with taxation without representation. So, obviously, the teachers don't know their stuff, right? Someone, three people, are, at least, are getting it wrong. Well, no, they're all, all these, all these statements are true. They're just different perspectives on the cause of the United States. In fact, there was more, there were more than, there, there was more than one cause or origin. Um, there was more, more than one instigatory cause of the United States. All of these statements are true. The teachers just weren't comprehensive. Each one emphasized a particular perspective. But what each of them said was accurate. Uh, I heard an illustration of this using uh, the 9-11 attacks. Uh, a critic might say, some reports say that a plane hit the World Trade Center, and other reports say that two planes hit the World Trade Center. Well, which is it? Well, both accounts are accurate. A plane hit the World Trade Center. Two planes hit the World Trade Center. Some accounts say that the attack was in New York City, and others say that it was in Washington, D.C. Which is it? Both are accurate. Some say it was an American Airlines flight, and others say it was a United Airlines flight. Which is it? Again, both are accurate. Of course, all of these are true. What's talked about in each case is what that particular author or speaker is focusing on. So let me give you an example um, from Scripture. We have two differing accounts of uh, the death of Judas, and on the surface they look to be somewhat contradictory. So in Acts chapter 1 we read, Now this man, Judas, acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that, so that the field was called in their own language a keldama, that is, field of blood. Then we have this account in Matthew's Gospel. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Now, there are multiple seeming discrepancies here. But are they really discrepancies? Are they true contradictions? Can they not be reconciled? And I think they can be reconciled. First of all, who bought the field? Um, the book of Acts says that Judas bought the field. Um, the truth is, Judas did buy the field. Because it was his money that bought the field. It was not his action, but it was his money. As, for instance, when my wife, uh, when my wife uh, says to me, Hey, you just bought Philharmonic tickets. I had no idea about Philharmonic tickets. 
It wasn't my action, but it was my money. And by the way, I'm happy. Um, actually, that's not true. She didn't buy farm mining tickets. That's just an illustration. Um, but Matthew says that the chief priests were the ones who, brought, who bought the field. Well, they did, because it was their action, though it was not their money. As, for instance, when your kids uh, buy themselves jeans with the money that you gave them. It wasn't their money, but it was their action. So with Judas, he bought the field. The mo his money bought the field. The chief priests, it was their action that bought the field. Both of them bought the field, you could say, from one perspective or another. How did Judas die? Did he fall headlong and burst open, or did he hang himself? Um, well, one possibility is that he hung himself, and then the branch that he was hanging on broke, and he fell headlong, and his body burst open in the middle, and all his bowels spilled out. It's possible to reconcile that, even as it's possible to reconcile the scenario of the woman who was killed by a bus and by a car, and by a car accident. And then, uh, why is it called field of blood? Two different reasons are given. Or two different reasons are given. One reason is it's called field of blood because Judas died in it, spilled his blood in it. And the other reason given, it's called field of blood uh, because it was purchased with blood money. Um, perhaps both reasons sprang up at the same time and people independently started calling it field of blood. Some because um, uh, for the reason that Judas died in it and some because it was bought with his blood money. I have a feeling more likely it was called field of blood for one of those reasons. Um, and uh, so that name spread about, and then one day some person heard that it was called Field of Blood, and he assumed it was for the other reason, and so that reason also developed. And so when some people called it Field of Blood because it was bought with blood money, and some people uh, 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 called it Field of Blood because uh, Judas died in it. So, you know, I, I don't see that any of those seeming discrepancies are. Um, are impossible to reconcile. Even as, it's, it's just like real life. It's just like perspectives on real life um, that seem to be contradictory in multiple ways and yet can be reconciled um, uh, when the full truth uh, comes to light. Or consider, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew says that Jesus taught it on a mountain. That's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Luke says that it was taught on a level place, on a plane. So who's wrong? First of all, why assume, why, why assume that someone is wrong? These could be differing perspectives. There's at least a couple possible, possible solutions as I see it. Um, uh, Jesus could have taught it on a level spot on a mountain. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but mountains are not perfect triangles. They're not perfect cones. Um, I've climbed one of the Grand Tetons and I didn't have to use any scaling equipment at all because there was plenty of level spots as you worked your way around the path up the side of the mountain. Uh, so there could be a level spot on a mountain. Jesus ascended a mountain, found a level spot, and the people joined him and that's where he taught. Or uh, uh, another possible solution is that Jesus could have preached this sermon more than once. In fact, I think he likely did. I think he preached a few sermons more than once. He was an itinerant preacher. And he told his disciples he was sent to go to all the uh, villages of Israel. So I, I think it highly likely that he taught the same thing over and over again because he had a different audience on many occasions. And so I can see him teaching it on a mountain, on a plane, in a house, on a train. Okay, probably not on a train. But you get the idea. It just depends on the perspective of the author. Another potential source of seeming discrepancies is when one author is more exact than another. For instance, how long was Israel in Egypt? Well, Genesis 15, 13 says 400 years, and so does Acts 7, 6. But Galatians 3, 17 says 430 years, and Exodus 12, 40 also says 430 years. Well, could it be that one passage is rounding it? <laughs> um, and are they wrong for rounding that number? Um, we, we should make a distinction when it comes, we should make a distinction between truth and accuracy. Um, we do it in everyday life, um, and the Bible makes no claim to have the accuracy that 21st century science demands. So, but we, but we even do it in our own life. For instance, if, if I have a car repair that's $309.46, 
and I go home and my wife says, my wife asks me, how much was the car repair? And I say $300. Am I lying? No, I'm not lying. I'm just rounding to the, to the nearest um, whole number, if you will, or the, the nearest hundred. Or my friends tell me that they're going to come over at 7 o'clock and they arrive at 6.54. Do you think that I should leave them out on the porch in the rain for six minutes to punish them for lying to me about when they were coming over? No, 7 o'clock was an approximation. It was an appro a legitimate approximation. They were telling me the truth. As one of my professors taught me, the Bible often deals in round numbers and gives generalizations and personal viewpoints. Um, and, and, and my professor, uh, Dr. Kenneth Concert, he also gave this uh, illustration about uh, viewpoints. He said, the importance of seeing the viewpoint from which the Bible speaks and understanding and its full truthfulness may be illustrated by true statements about a railroad track. So imagine a man standing on a railroad track and he's looking down the rails and um, you ask him what he sees and he says, I see that the two rails converge in the distance. From his perspective, that is a true statement. And then um, imagine an airline pilot flying above the railroad track. Well, she doesn't see that the rails converge. She sees rather that the, the rails are parallel and she writes that in her account, in her travel log that she saw the parallel rails of the, uh, of the railroad track. And then a scientist comes, and he comes to the rails, and he has a micrometer. Um, and he might say that the tracks are neither curved, uh, converging together, nor are they exactly parallel, but rather they are extremely jagged and uneven, as he measures the, difference, the, the distance between the rails at different points. Um, he may get, with his micrometer, um, very uh, uh, differing, uh, differing numbers, differing measurements. And from his point of view, with his micrometer, he is also correct. Each one is correct from their own perspective. And the question with regard to the Bible is, precisely what is the Bible committing itself to uh, when it gives varying perspectives on the same event? The accuracy issue is important to keep in mind with regards to quotations as well. For the New Testament writers sometimes quote Jesus. Well, in fact, the Gospel writers quote Jesus a lot. And, and the New Testament also quotes the Old Testament quite a bit. But word-for-word -word precision does not, does not often hold. Uh, the New Testament, those who are quoting others are not concerned with uh, a word-for-word -word accuracy. And, and, and often in life, we, we aren't concerned with word-for-word -word accuracy either, except in certain spheres. Um, so, for instance, even when, I, when I'm teaching, um, I'll often quote someone like C.S. Lewis or A.W. Tozer or Pastor Ryan or even Scripture, and I will not use their exact words. Rather, I'll be quoting from memory the gist of what they were trying to communicate and not their precise words. In real life, if I told you that government, uh, Governor Holcomb says that we have to wear face masks for a while to stop the spread of the coronavirus, you will probably not assume that that's the exact verbiage that Governor Holcomb used. Um, but you'll, you'll assume that I'm telling you the truth. Uh, you'll probably assume that I'm telling you the truth. In fact, he might have said it quite differently, but I will still have communicated the gist of his order. And later, when you hear his actual words, you will not think that I have misquoted him. Sometimes in Scripture, the quotations are full quotations. Sometimes they are just partial quotations, and sometimes a, a summary of what was said by the other book or the other person is given. In fact, it's believed that the, that the, the sermons, all, all the sermons in the book of Acts, as well as the Sermon on the Mount, are, are summaries, are, are summaries of what was actually preached. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, it takes like 10 minutes or something like that. You read it out loud. Um, likely, Jesus spoke for longer than that. Likely, uh, Paul preached for longer than that um, in, in the synagogues. And what we have in Acts are summaries of what Paul preached. Okay, well, let's, let's, look, at some, um, let's look at some more alleged discrepancies in the Bible. The first one, uh, should the disciples take a staff and sandals or not? 
Um, in Mark chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 10, Jesus, when he's commissioning the 12, he says, Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And in Mark chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, Jesus charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. So in sending out the twelve, Matthew says that Jesus says that they are not to take even a staff or sandals, while Mark says that Jesus says that they can take a staff and sandals, but nothing else. So who's right? Well, let's ask Matthew and Mark, shall we? Shall we get them on the line? Shall we call them? Right. They're dead. We can't question them or any of their peers. Well, are there, are there possible ways where they both might be right? Uh, yes, I think there are possible ways where they both might be right. Possibility number one. Jesus didn't talk to the whole group at once, uh, but to two or more smaller groups at different times. So to one group of six, he says, I want you to live spare. Uh, you know, I want you to trust fully in God. And don't even take staff or sandals or anything else. And to another, and to another group, the other six, he says, I want you to live spare. You know, I want you to, I want you to uh, be, uh, be trusting fully on God to take care of your needs. So uh, don't take any of this stuff along with you except a staff and sandals. So it's possible that he said both in two different, to two different groups. Possibility number two. Um, first, the first thing he said was, no bag, only one tunic, no staff, no sandals. And then Philip raises his hand, and Philip said, a staff would come in handy. And I've heard that Bethsaida streets are really bad. And so Jesus changes his mind, and he says, okay, you can take a staff and sandals, but none of the other stuff. Um, I can see that happening. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I think there's places in Scripture where God gives instructions and then the person comes back and says, uh, but, and so God alters his instructions. Um, I wish I could remember places like that. It, it seems like, uh, I, I know that happened like with a uh, Lot. Um, the, the angels come to Lot and they tell him to flee to a certain spot. Um, I'm going to look that up. Yeah, it's here in Genesis 19. Uh, as soon as the angels got them outside, one of them said, Run for your lives, don't look back, and don't stop anywhere on the plain. Run to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please, your servant has indeed found favor in your sight, and you have shown me great kindness by saving my life. But I can't run to the mountains. The disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Look, this town is close enough for me to run to. It is a small place. Please let me go there. It's only a small place, isn't it? So that I can survive. And he said to them, all right, I'll grant your request about this matter too, and will not demolish the town you mentioned. Hurry up, run there, for I cannot do anything until you get there. Therefore, the name of the city is Zoar. So there, there's an instance where uh, divine uh, instructions were given, in this case through an angel, um, and uh, the person comes back and, and, and asks for a change in the instruction, an alteration in the instructions, and uh, a... Com uh, 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 a positive answer is given. And so I, I can imagine that this might be the case with Jesus' instructions about, uh, you know, don't take any of this stuff with you. Um, no, no sandals, uh, no staff. And one of the disciples says, well, well how, about, how about just a staff and sandals at least? And Jesus says, okay, you can do that. Possibility number three. Jesus gave both sets of instructions um, to all 12 uh, without an interruption. Uh, Mark perhaps relates the part early on in the in instructions where Jesus is telling his disciples what they shouldn't and shouldn't take from what they already possess. Um, and Matthew relates the part where Jesus is telling them what they can't further acquire at Walmart. He, you know, <laughs> so he, he's saying to them, um, you know, don't take this stuff, don't take this stuff, except for your sandals and your staff. And then he's saying, and then he says later, and, and don't go to Walmart and buy yourself a bag and two tunics and an extra pair of sandals and a staff or something like that. Of course, Walmart's an anachronism, but you get the idea. I hope. Possibility number four is this. Um, the writers are summarizing his instructions. The gist of which is don't take extra equipment. Um, and so they're giving some details to his generaliz generalized commands. 
So perhaps what he originally said was something like, don't take extra stuff, like a bag of bread. You know, any extra things you don't really need. And Matthew's take on that is, he told us not to take a bag or extra tunic or sandals or a staff. But Mark's take on it is, he told them to take nothing, no bread, no bag, no money, just the bare essentials, like a staff and sandals. Um, so for instance, you know, modern day illustration, uh, mom says to Jack and Jill, I want this room as clean as you can get it. And Jill interprets that as put everything away, vacuum, dust, and wash the windows. But Jack interprets it as put everything away, vacuum and dust, but you really don't have to wash the windows. You know, so there's, there's different, um, the, those, poss those four possibilities right there on, um, on how uh, Jesus could have said um, both, uh, both things. Another discrepancy. How long was Jesus in the tomb? Um, you know, the Bible indicates that he was in the tomb. Uh, he rose on the third day. Uh, but there's a place where Jesus says that he will be in the grave for three days and three nights. Well, you know, as we understand scripture, he was buried on Friday evening and he rose on Sunday. Um, around 36 hours, but the idea of three days and three nights could lead one to believe that he was in the tomb for 72 hours. So if, if we're looking for 72 hours and only that will satisfy us, then yes, there is an error in the Bible. And... But, but understand that you're imposing your scientific precision on an imprecise culture. Um, and, and time reckoning in that day um, was different than in our day. Any, in, in that day, any part of a day counted as one day. Uh, I came across this in my reading just a couple days ago as I was reading through 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 12. And Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow, or the third day, behold, if he is well disposed toward David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? So, in Jonathan's understanding, the next day was the second day, and the day after tomorrow was the third day. Jesus reckoned time the same way. Um, uh, Luke chapter 13, and Jesus said to them, Go and tell that fox, referring to Herod Antipas, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. So any part of a day counted as a day. So he was in the tomb Friday evening, counts as one day. Uh, he was in the day all day Saturday, counts as two days. Uh, he was in the day just for part of... Um, Sunday morning, that counts as the third day. Three days in the tomb, though it was really only about perhaps 36 hours. So when Jesus says at that one point, I think it's in the Gospel of Matthew, three days and three nights, it's a manner of speaking. It's a matter of, spe it's a manner of speaking in his culture that me simply meant three calendar days, and you understand that they reckon their calendar days as a partial day. Um, a partial day meant... Um, a full day, either full or partial. So he wasn't speaking with the precision of 21st century Westerners. Westerners. And, and speaking of manners, mannerisms in terms of talking or ways of speaking, um, this this isn't a discrepancy here, but in a similar way, when, when Jacob accuses Laban of changing his wages ten times, I don't. I personally don't assume that uh, Laban actually changed Jacob's wages ten times. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to learn that um, Laban changed Jacob's wages maybe eight times or even just five times. Um, I, I'm, I would not be surprised to find, it, it could be literal, it could be literal that Laban actually changed Jacob's wages ten times, but it could be a manner of speaking. You've changed my wages a lot, you cheat, you scoundrel. Uh, that's what I assume that Jacob is saying when he says, you've changed my wages ten times. Uh, similarly, in the book of Revelation, where um, I don't remember to whom it's written, but Jesus says to the one church, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, um, the devil will put you in prison and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that ten days means ten 24-hour periods uh, in a row. I, I think it means it's, it's, a, it's referring to 
for a specific period of time. Um, a period of time that may last a while, but it will, it will not last forever. Okay, uh, next possible discrepancy, <clears throat> or alleged discrepancy. What happened at the sixth hour on the day that Jesus was crucified? What happened at the sixth hour on that uh, Friday? According to John's Gospel, at the sixth hour, Pilate presented Jesus to the crowds and said, Behold your king. But according to Mark's Gospel, Jesus had already been on the cross for three hours, and darkness was coming over the land at the sixth hour. Uh, so, who is not telling us the truth? Which gospel is wrong, or are they both wrong? Well, what if your wife told you that she went shopping with your son at 2 o'clock? But what if your son told you that he went shopping with your wife at 1400 hours? Is someone lying to you? Who would you believe? Who would you accuse of lying? Well, of course, they're using different reckonings of time. And in fact, they mean the same thing. Neither one is lying to you. They're just using different reckonings of time. In the same way, it's quite possible that John is using uh, uh, the Roman reckoning of time, which begins where the day begins at midnight, and so the sixth hour would be 6 a.m. And Mark is using the Jewish reckoning of time that begins with sunrise, and so the sixth hour would be um, around 12 p.m. So when, when, uh, when John says that um, Jesus was presented to the crowds and Pilate said, Behold your king at the sixth hour. That would be 6 a.m. When Mark says at the sixth hour that darkness came over the, the surface of the land and Jesus had already been on the cross for three hours, that's also the sixth hour. But for Mark and the Jews, that's 12 p.m. and not 6 a.m. Uh, so neither one is lying. It's just a matter... It, it's, a, it's a formal discrepancy because... Mark says this happened at, at the sixth hour, and John says this happened at the sixth hour. It's a formal discrepancy, but then you recognize that the sixth hour here means a, is a different sixth hour than here. Another possible discrepancy. Did King Asa remove the high places or not? Um, uh, 1 Kings 15, 14. Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. 2 Chronicles 14.5, he removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. 2 Chronicles 15.17, although he did not remove the high places from Israel, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. Um, notice that the last two passages are both in 2 Chronicles, and they're both just a chapter apart. They seem to contradict one another. He removed the high places, chapter 14, chapter 15, he did not remove the high places. But it is highly unlikely that the chronicler was so dense that he contradicts himself within the space of two short chapters. Um, so, you know, there's, there's possible solutions. There, there's different possible solutions. Let me just run through a few. Um, one is that Asa reigned, we know that Asa reigned for 41 years. He could have removed the high places early in his reign, and then over time, people could have rebuilt them, and, not, and then nothing was done about it. Or uh, another possible solution is that um, it was his general policy that he removed the high places, but it was not carried out thoroughly, so that many high places still remained. Um, or we could be talking about two different sets of high places, um, those dedicated to idols and those dedicated to the Lord, although I don't think that's likely. Um, but I, I, think the, I think the answer actually comes in the context of both verses. Look at 2 Chronicles 14.5. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah. 2 Chronicles 15.17. Although he did not remove the high places from Israel, um, Judah and Israel were two different um, countries. Uh, they were two different kingdoms. Asa was king over the um, kingdom of Judah. He was not king over Israel. So that doesn't make sense. Why, why would they say that he did not remove the high places from Israel? Well, of course he did. He wasn't king there. And yet we know from Scripture that he uh, actually part of Israel was under his influence and sway at that time. So that is also a possible Scenario where he was actually king over part of Israel, had sway over part of Israel, but he did not remove the high places. So there's there's different ways to 
to uh, deal, uh, to reconcile those statements where he removed the high places and he didn't. Uh, another question is, uh, did Jesus get his facts wrong? Did Jesus get his facts wrong? In Mark chapter 2, verse 26, Jesus says that in the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread. Uh, he's talking about David, by the way. In the days of Abiathar the high priest, David entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Now, what um, 2 Samuel, or 1 Samuel 21 tells us is that when David went to the town of Nob, um, he, he went and talked with Ahimelech, the priest. Abiathar was not the high priest at the time, it was Ahimelech. And so David dealt with Ahimelech. And Ahimelech was the one that gave him the consecrated bread and David ate. And then, if you recall the rest of the story, then um, uh, Saul then called the house of Ahimelech to him, called Ahimelech and all the priests to him. And he had all the priests killed uh, for how he had Ahimelech had aided uh, David and his companions at that time. And we're told that Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, escaped. He was the only one who escaped. Um, so that's the situation. So why did Jesus say Abiathar in the days of Abiathar the high priest instead of Ahimelech the high priest? Was Jesus wrong? Well, uh, not necessarily. It was the days of Abiathar the high priest. Even though Ahimelech was the high priest at the time and Abiathar was not the high priest at the time, Abiathar was alive at that time, and it was his days. Those were the days of Abiathar. Um, it doesn't say that, it, it doesn't specify that those were the days specifically when Abiathar was the high priest. It simply says the days of Abiathar, the high priest. Um, and he was probably priesting at this time, <laughs> uh, for he was one who escaped the consequences of this day when Saul had 85 priests killed. And Abiathar is likely mentioned because he is more famous than Ahimelech, his father, was. Um, so when Jesus says, in the days of Abiathar the high priest, those were his days. Um, the action actually took place with Ahimelech, but those, Jesus was not inaccurate in saying that this occurred in that time when Abiathar was alive. I probably could have said that a lot shorter somehow, but anyway, you get the idea. Uh, one, more, one more discrepancy. Um, who prompted David to take a census? Who prompted David to take a census? First Chronicles chapter 21, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. Or, 2 Samuel 24, verse 1, Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. So who incited David to number Israel? Was it Satan or God? Uh, why can't it be both? Um, they both did. They both did. Satan did that he might uh, destroy David and Israel, that God might destroy them. He was hoping that God would destroy them for this sin. God did that he might judge David and Israel and bring them ultimately to repentance of their current sin of pride and that he might ultimately bring them back closer to himself. Satan incited David in inflaming David's pride and, and by using what other, whatever other nefarious means at his disposal. Um, God did in allowing Satan to so work, and perhaps by reducing um, the influence of God's own restraining grace upon David's heart. Just by way of illustration, Romans 1 talks about how the Gentiles persisted in their sin, and eventually what did God do? God gave them up to their sins. He gave them up to their own sinful, selfish desires. So who's the acting cause in Romans chapter 1? Well, the Gentiles persisted in their sins, so they had action, but God also had action in that he removed the, uh, the restraining grace and he gave them up to their sins. It was the Gentiles who sinned, but it was God who let them run full steam into their sin. And so it was Satan who, who directly incited David to count the troops. But it was also God who, removed, who possibly removed his restraining grace and allowed Satan um, to... Uh, uh, to have a powerful influence upon David. The author of 2 Samuel identifies the divine influence of God, and the author of 1 Chronicles identifies the demonic influence of Satan. Is the origin of America rooted in the Declaration of Independence, or is it rooted in the Revolutionary War? In both. In both. Is it possible, is it possible for enemies 
to want the same thing to happen. Of course it is. Of course it is. Think about, for instance, the uh, the uh, the Black Sox scandal in 1919, the the, the scandal where the the White Sox uh, seemingly threw the World Series uh, for gambling purposes. Uh, who 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 was working for the defeat of the White Sox in the World Series in 1919? Both teams were working for the defeat of the White Sox for different reasons. Um, even in our own day, you know, when when um, NFL teams are in, when, when when an NFL team has uh, failed to win a game at some point in the season, uh, there's talk about how they might be intentionally trying not to win any games so as to put themselves in a good position for the NFL draft in the next season. And so when they take the field, um, both the other team and themselves may be working towards their defeat. So it's not inconceivable to think of a situation in which two enemies are working uh, for the same goal, though they might have different um, they might have different uh, reasons or motivations um, for it. Well, for many apparent discrepancies, there are rational solutions. There are rational solutions. They may not always present themselves at the moment. And when you, when you come to a problem in the scripture, when you come to a seeming discrepancy or an alleged discrepancy or a seeming contradiction, uh, and you just cannot figure out the solution, you've Googled it, <laughs> uh, you looked up resources, You've, looked, you've tried to find what other people have to say about it and you just can't come up with any solutions to it, let me encourage you to reserve judgment for later. Reserve judgment for later. Put it on the back burner. Keep it in mind. Uh, keep it in mind that, and keep in mind also that you don't have all the facts. You don't have all the facts and that you are removed from the situation by at least 2,000 years. You know, um, I've had things in my mind that I, I did, uh, problems like that that just didn't make sense to me. And lo and behold, after a while, uh, light was shed on them, and uh, they make sense to me. And so they're no longer <laughs> in that spot of my brain like problems to be resolved. But, you know, then other problems come up, and, and, uh, and those are on the back burner of my mind as well. So reserve judgment. Uh, come with humility before the scriptures. And remember, remember that there is sufficient evidence to show that the Bible is, in fact, the very Word of God, and that it is inspired by Him, and without error. Um, think of the, the millions and millions and millions of people that have been transformed uh, for good by the Word of God. Um, uh, just, just think of the, the millions and millions of people who have been transformed for good um, because they read and studied the Word of God. It is a miraculous book um, and you can certainly put your faith and trust and confidence in it as the revelation and the word of God. Father, I thank you for this time together, and I pray for your blessing upon each one who is watching and listening to this video. And I pray, Lord, that um, uh, as they study the scriptures, that the scriptures would become more and more rooted in their hearts and in their minds, and that it would become formative in the way they live their lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, until next time.